All right, episode 41 of the Next Shift Podcast. I want to thank George for holding it down last week. He recorded the intro uh, by himself for the for the Doug Brown interview. Still haven't listened to that yet, by the way, but I, I've heard really good feedback. Um, unfortunately, Ryan and, and, and myself were kind of off the grid the last few weeks. Our mom passed away at a young age of 63. Um, exhausting couple of weeks but the support that we felt from the hockey community specifically just reminded us of how special uh, our network is in the game and um, people reaching out even people you're just you feel like are acquaintances um giving their support and so um I, I tried to like think of what to maybe say in um in uh, i guess you could say in memory of my mom on the podcast but i think just you know, she had a really strong faith. And I think anytime you're facing adversity, whether in hockey or in life, having that faith that your next move, whether that's what happens after you die or a career change or um, after a bad shift, having faith that that there's a plan and giving yourself, uh, giving your faith up to something bigger than you. I think that's the message. That's something that I've been sitting with um, the last couple of weeks. So, we kind of wrapped up all the services and everything yesterday and we're, we're ready to get back at it, but just did want to give a thank you to everyone who reached out um, in support of, of me and my family. Yeah, Sean, that was, that was great. It was certainly a tough, tough two weeks. It, you, you, you can't prepare for it as much as you might know, you know, there might be an end um, at some point with your parents. But one thing that I, I was thinking about before we jumped on here to talk when, and I know our audience um, is very, very, you know, a lot of you got out, both you and Sean and George and Sean work with a lot of young players and, 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 and have relationships with parents and understand it. But, you know, my mom was just, just like a, the, the a very, a, a big time hockey mom. She loved coming to the game. She loved, you know, when we were able to, to succeed or, or make a team and um, through this past week, you know, so much perspective was had where, you know, you, you know, me, we're sitting around talking about memories and so many of them are, are, are about hockey and, and how much she loved it and, and how much she loved that we loved it. And it was a, it was a bonding experience. So for any of the, those young, young players listening, you know, just it's hard because it, you're at a certain age where it's 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 almost like you need to lose it before you understand the the value in it in, in regards to your mom but just cherish having them at the rink and and know how much happiness you bring them by just playing and enjoy it like i know there's always goals that you're trying to reach and there's always these um you know there's always on to the next best thing but just understand that they're so happy to come watch you play a sport you love and 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 you know me and my brother were we're both very, very lucky to have him. Extremely supportive mom, and you know, even Sean yesterday was joking. He said, "You know, mom, when, whenever mom was trying to make me, you know, have a good game, she goes, Sean, I always tell you this when you're about to have a good game: move your feet. You know, it's just those type of things. They're great memories, and they're um, things that I'm gonna miss about her. And I'm, you know, but I'm so thankful that not only was she so supportive of our dreams and of our love for hockey, but that I know deep down that both my brother and I um, brought her so many memories from the time we, we were nine when we were, when we were on the junior Eagles all the way up to the end of our career. So um, love you, mom. Going to miss you like crazy. And uh, um, thanks for everything. Yeah. For uh, the hockey parents know that as frustrated as you can get in, along the ride, that the people that you're, um commiserating with up against the glass and having good times and bad times with um on your your son or daughter's teams those are the people that are there um when you need them and that was just that was so evident the last few weeks so love hockey. i think every junior eagles parent that we played with showed up to the wake it was unbelievable it was like yeah it was the support super, from the hockey community. so yeah <laughs> um <laughs> happy that all that's over with and um onward and upward um but thank you again yeah no that was i thought that was beautifully said by both of you guys and um your mom i would say it was a special person i remember just coming over to your guys's house and 
uh, just her smile. She would just brighten up the room and it just, she made it feel like home. Um, she's a great person, a special person. We'll miss her, but forever, forever in our hearts, like you guys said, and her legacy will live on forever in you guys. So, amen. Uh, well, well said amen. by you guys. And we're going to, um, we're going to bring on Freddie Meyer here. He's waiting in uh, the backstage of our new, um, I guess, podcast uh, system that we're using. Shout out to StreamYard yeah. um, for all the video content. So without further ado, let's bring on uh, Freddie Meyer, former BU Terrier, NHL defenseman. Um, we're going to need to start getting some BC guys at some point, but <laughs> we'll stick with the BU guys for now. What's up, Freddie? How's it going, guys? Not too bad. Thanks for hopping on with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I love the background there. You got unbelievable. Those, uh, I, know, I knew you were going to have a good background because I saw <laughs> you on uh, uh, Rink Shrinks. The Rink Shrinks. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, to give them a free ad. Yeah. So we, we needed to upgrade our uh, our layout here. So this is the second time we're using this, this thing. So hopefully it was easy enough for you to log on. Simple. Good. Good fun. deal. Should we just jump right into it then? Let's jump right in, George. Right. We won't yeah. have to edit a thing. Yeah, we're going right for it. Freddie Meyer, thanks a lot for coming on. We're going to start off with the icebreaker here. Um, I can't believe I didn't think about this earlier or see this clip earlier, but you know, I was searching YouTube for Freddie Meyer, and the first thing that comes up is uh, you know, your, your, big, your big hit on Lucic, and then there's a warning, though, before I open the video. You know, Some viewers might be offended by this clip. I go, oh, this is going to be good. So what do, you, what do you remember about that night and that hit on Lucic and the chaos that ensued after? I always said I'm still waiting for the Bruins to send me my uh, Stanley Cup ring because that's the year they ended up going on a run and winning the Cup, and I think I ignited the uh, – the inner, the inner Bruin, if that's what we want to call it. Um, no, for me, it was, it was the way I played the game. Um, now I didn't really see who was attacking or who's not attacking, but they put themselves in a situation um, that the hit presented itself. The hit happened, and before I knew it, the entire team was on my back, essentially. Um, so it kind of transpired from there. I got He sucker punched me at the end. Uh, which I think kind of started my unfortunate concussions that kind of spiraled from the next 12 or so months. But um, either way, I mean, I, I wouldn't have changed what I did. It's just kind of how I played. And, um, you know, I think some people question was, you know, I think we we're losing four to one or 42 with like four minutes to go. But, um, you know, my time in Atlanta, I was a sixth, seventh, eighth defenseman. So um, there was really no margin for not playing hard and completing games and, um just kind of how I always played and try to catch guys with their head down, making plays in the neutral zone. Yeah. After, sure. uh, after watching the clip too, I go, hockey is just missing this kind of energy. Cause you know, there's a line brawl. The garden is just rocking. And I, I was, I wanted to get your thoughts on Do you think we'll ever see another line brawl like that in the NHL or what, what are your thoughts on fighting in the, in the league? It's a good question. Um, I guess I get, I get, I'm a little disappointed. Like I understand why they've taken out a lot of the big hitting. Um, I think it's also on the flip side for me, it's, every big hit, there shouldn't be a fight either. Like I think there's an element of, of if you're skating with a puck through the neutral zone. You should be able to control your body and know what's coming and, and where it's coming from. And a lot of the onus is always on the defending player versus the offensive player that's got the puck. Um, I wish there was more of those hits, to be honest with you. Like I think there's, it holds people accountable to, to play the game the right way with your head up and making plays. And, um, you know, on the flip side, obviously I know the fans like the, the, the line brawl experience and, um, I mean, I, I flash back to the, the American League, and it's changed a lot too since uh, 03 and 04 and the years when I were there. But it was that was like a, I don't say a nightly thing, but the fear of it happening on a nightly thing was was very candid. Let's take it back to the beginning, Freddie. I know you're from New Hampshire. Um, I'm sure you came down to Boston quite a bit, you know, in the 90s as you were growing up. And I know, I guess. Greater Boston has always been kind of a hockey hotbed, but did you feel like you were able to hide a little bit in New Hampshire or were you still kind of in the thick of it um, as a minor hockey player? Um, I, I think back in the day, it was it's obviously totally different, right? With, with the, the power of the internet and the power of YouTube and whatever else, I don't feel like there's anybody, any place really to hide. And I don't know if as a kid growing up, um, it was looked at that way. I think it was just, you know, you just played and, um, you know, like, you, the word kind of spread, I guess, for kids that were on the, on the better end of the cusp. And then I, um, I think it was my, my peewee 
Uh, my, my second peewee year, I, I did come down and play on a, on a Massachusetts team in the, in the Metro League for the North, uh, North Shore Raiders. And, um, you know, from, from there, kind of it, it grew, you know what I mean? I, but even the teams that were in New Hampshire, we'd come down to Massachusetts every weekend to play games just because there wasn't enough, enough quality teams and enough quality players in, in New Hampshire back in, in, in those days. Freddie, and then in, in 1997, um, you joined a, a relatively new, uh, the NTDP, the U.S. National Development Program. Um, why don't you take us through that decision to join there? I know it, there wasn't much of a, like today, every player, you know, that's the dream. But back then it was so, so new. So why don't you talk about that experience and, and, and how it all came about? Yeah, good question. Um, I went to, uh, not to take one step back, Cardigan Mountain School. Uh, which is a junior boarding school, six through nine, uh, up by Dartmouth College. I brought my older brother went there, so my parents uh, uh, sent sent me there as well in terms of uh, for the education and, and hockey. Uh, at the time, was was a pretty strong program. So I was at the I was at Cardigan uh, at a junior boarding school, and, and at the time exploring secondary schools down in you know Massachusetts in Connecticut with Deerfields and Cushions and St. Pauls, and uh, looking at secondary schools for high school, and that was kind of the 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 prep route was going to be the way. And, um, you know, kind of out of nowhere, uh, at the time it was Bob Mancini was one of the, one of the head guys for the national program, um, came up, watched a few games and, and sat down with my parents and I and offered us a spot. And as you said, it was, the, the program was just forming. There was, they knew nothing about nothing besides trying to grab, uh, you know, 45 players to, to move out to Ann Arbor, Michigan for the upcoming season. And, um, you know, it was, I guess, a little bit of a, I guess, a potential risky decision at the time. Um, there was some other kids that I play with growing up, Andy Hilbert and John Sabo and, and some other 1981 birth, birth years that were also getting an opportunity. And uh, we kind of jumped on it together and, and, and you know, hindsight's 2020, but it was, it was probably, you know, the best decision I could have made at that time in terms of um, peer development and, and obviously training and obviously now the the program speaks for itself in terms of, of draft, you know, first overall draft picks and legit NHLers and the success they've had, uh, you know, winning, winning medals and gold medals, obviously recently here. Yeah. Freddie. And before we, uh, you know, get into your next step with uh, BU and your pro career, I wanted to dial dial back a little bit farther. And I was just reading some, you know, articles on you and you were, you would uh, often say, I was just worried about my next game, my next practice as a youth player. So, and you didn't envision yourself playing in the NHL or even playing college hockey. So, why do you think you made it? Luck. Luck. <laughs> really? Well, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I guess as a, as a player uh, kind of going through it, and like I said, I was at Cardigan with the national program, um, you know, like I guess I was on a pretty good track, you know, looking back at it. But even at that moment, um, it wasn't like, hey, you signed with the national program. Here's your, here's your NHL contract. At, at that point, it was, you know, college scouts were trying to still figure out what that national program even was. Where'd you get these guys? Who are they? Um, so it took some time for that, that, that snowball to get rolling. Uh, but, but for me, it was, it was, you know, you were psyched to have a chance to play, you know, division one college hockey. Um, and obviously for me, it was at BU and have an opportunity chance that, you, you know, Jack Parker wants to have a conversation with you and you, you kind of like, I guess a naive 16, 17, 18 year old kid. And, and then you're at BU and, and you're playing college hockey and in the same way, like going through that process, you know, not drafted, undersized, like the chance of playing pro hockey was like, that's for like Ray Bork. Like I'm not Ray Bork. I'm just, I'm just a college hockey player here. Um, and so for me, it was, it was, yeah, literally kind of one day at a time and just keep putting the work in and keep training and, 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 and keep waiting for opportunity. I got one more here before Sean jumps in. Do you, is there a sense of pride with the guys, the first guys at the national development program and uh, within, you know, USA hockey, considering how, where you guys started to where USA hockey is now? I mean, I, I think so. Definitely. There's definitely a group of us that stay connected um, and text each other quite regularly. That, that kind of came through that the first year or two, um, you know, it would, it'd be, it would be, uh, I feel like it's probably those first couple of teams probably aren't talked about enough. Uh, it's kind of the icebreaker. And uh, obviously, you know, we have, um, I should know this stat. I don't even know. Ron Hainsey is probably the last guy that was still standing at the NHL level. And I'm not sure if Ron's still playing. Um, I hope he is, you know, God, God bless him to play at 40 years old. But, you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day. I turned 40 a couple of weeks ago and, um, you know, like it was 20 something years ago. It's pretty impressive. Uh, you know, 45 parents, 
you know, essentially signed off on to ship their kid to Ann Arbor, Michigan from, you know, the, the woods of New Hampshire to the woods of Alaska and in, and in all the way in, be, in between. And, um, you know, we got there and, and, you know, hats off. I talked to somebody today about Jeff Jackson. Jeff Jackson was, um, in my eyes, kind of the godfather of that program and, and a very, very brilliant hockey mind and a guy that, that, you know, was teaching us stuff that, that not a lot of kids learned at that age. And, um, you know, it was impressive what they, what they, done, what they did those years. And obviously, uh, as I said earlier, the track record has, has been impressive, but, you know, maybe they'll have us like a, you know, a 25 an anniversary special party that <laughs> some of the other big wigs that have come through there in the past could, could put something on for us, 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 I guess, original alumni or some. And I know you, you coach younger players and I think there is for the younger guys nowadays, there's this recency bias a little bit because the players that have come out of there, I guess, you know, really started to heat up at the 97 birth year. And there's almost the sense now where if you don't, get picked for the national program you might as well hang it up so like do you have an appreciation for um like you mentioned you there's never an expectation at every level so do you have an appreciation with the players that you coach to kind of remind them everyone's path is different don't get caught up in the hype um every, everyone's timing is different yeah i think that's always important I th and i think Unfortunately, it's a it's a good problem we have currently, but a bad problem. Social media makes it, you know, everybody knows everyone's business and everything that's going on and, and, and everything is quantified and there's these lists and this list and that list. And, you know, I, I think for me, it's, you know, and it's it's not a, a segue, but my my private business, Dream Big Hockey Stars. And I guess for me, it's always that motto of just dreaming big like, you you, yeah. you, you know, you know, shoot your goals high, but you might not get them all, but keep chasing them. And and I think, uh, yeah, if you don't make the national program, that's, you know, it's truthfully, it's 20 something kids at one birth year uh, versus the, you know, the thousands of kids or hundreds of thousands of kids playing at that birth year. And, um, you know, it's an incredible honor uh, for whoever gets chosen for that each year. Uh, but that's not saying they don't miss a guy. You know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people in between. And, and, and I would, as I would say to anybody, use as motivation. Um, and you know, that's something that I would, you know, flashing back at BU and not getting drafted and, um, being an all American and all this stuff and, and, and not being drafted. And, but that was just motivation for me to, to keep kicking butt and keep training hard and, and, uh, and keep pushing forward. And so it's, it, for me, those are kind of, you know, I flush back to little kids I work with that might be nine or 10 years old. And, you know, you, you want to make that elite team locally or wherever you're playing and you don't make the team like doesn't mean you need to quit hockey. It means you need to go out in your driveway and shoot more pucks or, no. or, 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 or get some more in private instruction or whatever it may be. So you can get better at that. And, um, or at least give, give yourself an opportunity to be the best you can be at that, at that moment. Um, but use it as an, use it as a stepping stone to motivate you. Uh, not as, Hey, my career's done. What do I do now? And, and, you know, I don't know what the stat is currently, but when I was kind of coming through it, there was always, you know, the first round flop was kind of a, a real thing where a lot of kids drafted in the first round, never even played a game in the NHL. Yep. Um, so there's, there's, that, that, that's kind of a, a same way. Like just cause you get drafted doesn't mean you got to, you can stop working. That's when the work starts. Right. Yep. So hundred percent. Freddie. So, at, you know, you are a new England guy or, you know, I'm sure you were a big, you know, college hockey fan, my guess would be, or you were at least aware of the BU, BCs, Northeasterns, UNHs. Um, how did the BU decision come about? Obviously, at that time, that was the that, that was the powerhouse of the area. So, um, where was the 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 recruiting process was like for you, and and, and how did you ultimately pick Boston University? Uh, good question. I was um, obviously for the high school. I was at, in in Michigan, um, and so just. I guess as a starting point, my parents obviously were still living in New Hampshire. I wanted to get back out east. Um, so they were closer. They were able to watch more games and it was a better family situation. Um, so that kind of, you know, cut out some maybe Michigan schools that I might have been talking to initially to target schools back out east. Um, for me, it came down to BU, UNH and Maine as kind of the last three that I was exploring. Um, I went to BU January, essentially first of my freshman year. I missed the first half because I needed a couple of high school credits left. Um, and so kind of knowing that I was going to go somewhere in January uh, at the time, Dickie Umilly was the coach at UNH and he thought I would come in and, and disrupt his chemistry. And he wanted me to come in the fall, uh, the, you know, the following fall. And so 
that was kind of an easy decision to push them off the list and then um, came down between BU and Maine. And um, obviously at the time, Coach Walsh was up at Maine and, and an incredible recruiter and, and, and Maine itself was was had some really strong teams that had come through in the in the 90s and obviously early 2000s. And um, he made it a really hard decision, to be honest with you. But um, obviously going to school in Boston and, and having some teammates that were also there, the kids I've played with growing up with uh, Rick DiPietro's and, and John Sabo's and uh, some of these guys that I grew up playing with as 81s and at the national program. Um, you know, even Pat Alfiero was, was an 80. He was at the national program. And, and Pat was a guy that I played on the North Shore Raiders with, you know, four years before. So there was a lot of connection point into BU and um, obviously the, you know, the, the, the alumni that have come through there and, and coach Parker, obviously uh, his track record and, 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 and just the, and just, I guess for me, that'd be the coolness factor of going to school in Boston as well. Yeah. So you gotta be like, you gotta be like the 10th BU guy we've had on. And so (laughs) you guys are generous with your time when it comes to popping on podcasts. We appreciate it. Speaking of that, did, um, did you know at the time that, uh, you know, your teammate Ryan Whitney would be a nationally renowned podcast celebrity. I did not know Ryan and I are pretty good friends at BU and obviously he's got a good, good dry sense of humor and uh, he's kind of found his niche and, and, and God bless him. He's, he's, he's run with it. And uh, I still chuckle and laugh when I hear him say certain things that, you know, we might've chuckled and laughed about back in 01 or 02. Yeah, Freddie, and you mentioned uh, that's funny. We got to get Wit on, by the way. But uh, you mentioned- <laughs> well, you you need to you need to get on their podcast more than Ryan Whitney is going to be willing to <laughs> yeah. come on ours. Okay, we'll see. Right. We'll see. But Freddie, you, you mentioned Jack Parker, legendary coach at BU forever, and being a coach now, or like, what are some of the your memories of of uh, Coach Parker, and what do you kind of take away from him that you could uh, implement yourself as a coach? Um, good, good, uh, good, good idea. Like it's, it's obviously Jack was, you know, came through in a time where I would say it's a little bit more of an old school coaching philosophy. Um, obviously an incredible motivator, incredible in spot, you know, in, in, able to inspire the troops, able to fire the troops up. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, overall guys had a ton of respect for him. You know, you'd see him around campus or at T Anthony's you grab a slice of pizza and, uh, you know, he could, he's, a, he's a, he's a great talker and a, and a great communicator and, uh, has a unique ability, a, a unique ability to tell crazy stories. And I don't even know how he remembers half of them, but he does. Um, so, you know, some of those messages, I think, um, obviously his practices were, were, were hard. They were long. Um, but it was a little bit more of the old school approach at that point when I was there. Um, you know, what, what did I, what, what have I taken from Jack? I think just same way of, uh, have, being, having a personality and be able to communicate with, with the guys um, in order to, you know, form relationships. And um, I think the biggest thing for me with coaching is, is guys got to, they, they got to trust you and believe in you and they got to, they got to know that you got their back. And I think Jack was a guy that, that did that. He was a guy that, you know, he would have your back. You know, there's moments that, you know, him and I didn't always see eye to eye and he would yank guys down the tunnel, Walter Brown, and, and give you a, give you a, give you a word or two of, of motivation if that's the right way to say it. Um, but on the flip side, you know, he'd give you a hug after the game as well because you knew he had your back. And I, I think that mutual respect uh, on both ends of the, of the scope is, is, is really important. And, um, you know, for me, I, I, I think about coaches I had, and obviously it started at the national program, I would say, with, with, with Jeff Jackson and Bob Mancini and Greg Cronin and to Jack Parker, to Ken Hitchcock and um, Craig Ramsey and, and a bunch of, you know, incredible hockey minds and incredible coaches. And um, I think it's important – you know, as you're trekking through your own coaching career is, is kind of create your own, who are you, you know? And, and for me, I would, I would say I'm a, I'm a, I try to be a player's coach. And I know that term is probably a little bit overused, but um, you know, I, I think in order for guys to buy in and in, in, in to believe what you're telling them um, once again, they need to respect you. They need to know that you got their back and uh, building friendships is, is super important to, to when you, when you need to be hard on those guys, they also respect that as well, that, all right, you're not hard on me every day. If you're hard on me every day, I'm going to turn you out. Uh, but all right, I must be doing something wrong here if this needs to be fixed. And um, that's been the, that's been the fun thing for me is just building relationships with guys and 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 having guys text you a few years later to thank you for uh, their time with you or or a flashback or or just when they see you, they have a big smile on the face and, and you know that they had a good experience. And and once again, I always say like I'm coach. We we coach. I coach a game. Like well, this is a game. This is supposed to be fun. 
Um, you know, like I want to jump in and have fun and, and battle in a one-on-one -on -one and uh, enjoy the moment. This is nothing more than uh, me trying to help you enjoy a game. Uh, and if we're not smiling most of the time, then we've kind of missed the point of, of what we're trying to play here. It's, it's interesting because those coaches you mentioned, everyone, Jeff Jackson all the way up to uh, Hitchcock, like pretty defensive minded and they don't let guys cheat, especially in the era that you played in, like unless you were, like you said, you looked up to Ray Bork, but unless you were like putting up those numbers, I'd imagine it was hard to get those types of coaches to give you a long leash to let your offensive game kind of take shape. Um, so, but again, looking back at your clips, you were able to defend really well. How did you balance, you know, being a puck moving defenseman or point producing defenseman at the college level was still taking pride in defending really hard as an undersized guy? I wish my oh, horrible, were... horrible, horrible question, but I, no, I, was... I, wish, I wish my points, <laughs> but I was a little bit more of an offensive defense. <laughs> I've having, seen you. I've seen you skate. I've seen you skate on that Tuesday I nights at daily. Oh, so no. I don't know if my maybe I just assumed it. No, you know what? I I think uh, I guess for me, and maybe it goes back to being naive and who I was as a player. Um, I just wanted to play as hard as I could. Um, I could skate. That you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, growing up in the middle of New Hampshire with with no skating coaches and uh, no special rink passes or anything. I, I could skate. Um, and so I try to use that to my advantage. And it, I probably made up for a lot of maybe some mistakes along the way and, and, and outskated my opponents. Um, but on the flip side, yeah, I would, I would try to jump in the rush as much as I could. Um, you know, I always, I guess as a player, you always want to produce more. Um, and I, I think, you know, actually a few years in the minors, I, I had some great numbers and, um, you know, I think, I think if you play the game the right way, and now as a coach, I look back at this, like if you play the game the right way, the coaches allow you to jump up in the play as long as you're, you're not cheating just to try to get points. Um, and I think a lot of the messages I preach to my guys is, you know, the D is the second or second, second layer on the rush um, or the D is, you know, you watch some of the uh, closely, some of the NHL defensemen that, that can skate and play like those guys are, you know, fourth and fifth guys offensively in the offensive zone. Um, you know, most of their goals and points are coming from below the tops of the circles uh, just because they're so active at the offensive blue line. They're not just standing stationary. And I think, um, um, you know, I think about it now when I work with, with kids that are maybe playing major junior or USHL or any, you know, North American league. And, and they, they, the first thing they tell me, they're a stay at home defenseman. I'm like, you don't use that term. That term is, that, that is only going to handcuff you. Like who wants a guy that just stands in front of the net? Like yeah. you, need to be, you need to be mobile and you need to jump up in the rush. You need to pick your spots. Um, you know, I think Parker and I, you know, to reflect back and coach Parker, like some of the times I get yanked down, down the tunnel um, were times that I were, I was jumping in the rush and he did not, he didn't quite see it the same way. I think at the pro level, um, although Ken Hitchcock wants his team to defend really well, um, and the X's and O's, you know, he's one of the best in the game. He also understands the point of, you know, getting D involved in the rush and offensively in order to pr produce more offensively. Um, so I think there's a balance in there as long as you're playing the right way um, at the right times and, and you're picking your spots in those moments. Freddie, so after your senior year in 2003 would be you, um, you were undrafted um, and you signed, it looks like, with the Philadelphia Flyers and even got a game in the uh, 03 04 season, which I believe was the year before the lockout. So, um, why don't you just talk about the, the free agency process as an undrafted free agent? I th obviously, today it's a drastically different landscape with entry level deals and all that. So, um, how did you know ultimately end up in Philadelphia? And then, um, you know, how did that first NHL game come about? Yeah, good. Um, so yeah, I was I was undrafted out of BU. Um, as I mentioned earlier, as a senior, I was an all first team All American. Um, but that still was, you know, I think once again for me, looking at it, like I think the knock on me was I was too small. Um, you know, I wasn't strong enough. Um, you know, I, I remember and I'll quick quick story time, but went went and met with a uh, an agent at the time that uh, sorry uh, a scout for a time that was working for San Jose, and I did some workouts for him and and whatever he had me do agility wise. And then he asked me who I compared myself to at the time. And I said, Brian Rafalski, um, who obviously undersized the fence and played in Detroit. I think he was in New Jersey maybe at the time. And, you know, he's like, Ugh. and he kind of laughed at me like Brian Rafalski is way stronger than you are. 
And I'm thinking to myself, like, no, he's not. But, um, you know, I think it was just the time is just a knock on, you know, my, I guess my, you know, my height in a way. Um, and so Philly, Philly was one of the, the organizations that um, was, was a little bit more proactive with the process and, and offered me a, an opportunity uh, to come down to Philly on a, on a two way contract and NHL, AHL deal and um, kind of fight for my life to, to try to make the gig at pro hockey. Um, went down there in the summer for rookie camp. And at that point, um, they just drafted Mike uh, Richards and Jeff Carter. Uh, I think in the, o th- in the, sorry, that was, uh, yeah, in the O3 draft. And uh, those guys were there in the summertime. So worked out and, ha- and, and skated with those guys and then came back in September. And um, same way, it was, you, you, you go in those environments of undrafted, undersized free agents. And, you know, you're, you're, you look on the depth chart and you see, you know, X amount of guys that have been drafted ahead of you. So for me, it was, there was a little bit of a, I guess, a hierarchy that I knew I had a, I had to just, show up in shape and, and try to kick ass as best I could and um, compete hard and work hard. And, um, you know, I think the one thing that I look back on for me, it's consistency. Um, you know, I, I, I say it to my own kids, like, like it's great if you have one good game, but like that doesn't make you a hall of famer. Like you need to, you need to show up and do the same thing every day. Um, and I think, you know, if you talk to guys that have played um, with certain guys in the NHL, Patrice Bergeron, and it always just comes to mind, but, he does the exact same thing every day. You know what you're going to get out of him. And I think um, for me, no one really told me that. I didn't really have, you know, my, my parents didn't play. I, you know, my, my, you know, I didn't really have anyone advising me in, in a way of, of, of that session, but I just try to show up and do the right things every day and kind of chip away at it. The first two months or so in, in the American league, I was a healthy scratch and I'm thinking to myself, like, what am I doing here? Like, I, like, like you felt like you're better than guys that you're playing against, but obviously they had, they checked a few other boxes that I didn't at the time. Um, and I just kept chipping away and chipping away and working and finally got an opportunity and started to play and, um, consistency and played hard and, um, was starting to produce a little bit offensively and, and just kept chipping away. And, um, yeah, like in the, in the second half of that Oh three Oh four year, uh, you know, we had a pretty good team. They always had pretty good teams in Philly and the minors at that point, but just kept chipping away. And, um, actually was, a, I took warmups a game or two, uh, at the NHL, you know, with the Flyers that year before I actually played in a game. Uh, the only reason I really played in one game that year was uh, the game bef- the game or two before I played. Uh, I think there was a line brawl or two. A bunch of guys got suspended, so they needed some quick bodies to go down to Washington Washington to play in a couple of days. But um, I was definitely like – it was shocking to me like because I went in the American League. I was, I was low guy on the totem pole, and before I know it, I'm the guy that they're calling up, you know, to take warm-ups – um, in case, you know, Chris Tarion was a guy that was kind of on the back end of his career and had some injuries and, and was in and out of lineup a little bit. So I was the guy and I was kind of like, how am I the guy? I, I'm just like this undersized defenseman from New Hampshire that's just like trying to be consistent. Um, and it kind of just snowballed from there. And the 4 5 season was the lockout, as you mentioned. And um, I guess, you know, I guess arrogantly, obviously, we won it in Philly that year, the Calder that's Cup. Right. And the American League, in my eyes, was the best American League has ever been and will ever be that year. Um, you know, Bergeron was in Providence and, uh, and, and the stalls were in, 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 in Lowell and, and Spezza was in Binghamton and, you know, Heatley and all these guys were playing in the American league. Um, so that was, that was, that was a, that was a good thing that I was on a good team in the American league. Um, and it was also a good thing. I was playing against NHLers the entire year and you kind of almost to yourself, you're like, actually I'm closer to this than I think I am. Um, this isn't that far away. Like I got to keep training and keep plugging away and, and keep grinding and, 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 and hopefully I get my opportunity. And, and luckily um, coming out of the, uh, out of the 405 season, the uh, 2005 training camp in Philly um, was kind of my like, all right, this is the time. And then I actually broke my leg in training camp. Once again, my good buddy, Chris Terrian that I used to take warmups for, and then he would, he would tell me he could play after I was, you know, all fired up to play in my first NHL game. Uh, him and I were, were, we were playing together and against, um, I don't know who we were in. It was an exhibition game in, in, uh, in London, Ontario, and just playing a two on two. And he got kind of crossed over and fell and landed on the side of my leg. And, uh, next thing you know, it was broken. I was out for, I think six or eight weeks and, um, rehab came back and, and got sent, you know, was, was back down in the American league for about two weeks to get some training and felt good. And then I got a chance 
to get called up to the Flyers. And um, this is, goes back to the, the luck and the opportunity I talked about at the beginning, although it's somewhat comical. It's the truth. Um, I was a sixth defenseman. Eric, Eric Desjardins was on the team. Eric Desjardins took a hit, I think, 10 to 12 minutes into the first period, out with a separated shoulder for five to six weeks. And now I'm a fifth defenseman in the NHL. Um, yeah. Just kept chipping away. And I always say to kids, it's, it's opportunity will present itself, but you got to be ready to kick the door down. And if you're not ready to kick the door down, there's somebody else waiting for it. So, um, you know, you got you to gotta be ready for the moment. And when the opportunity and the opportunity presents itself, be ready to roll and, and you know, knock on wood from that point. I kind of um, made the most of that and, 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 and kind of never looked back. It's like Tory Krug in 2013, but that, that comes to mind. But I just can't imagine going out, like dressing for warm-ups in an NHL game, having to go back into the locker room, get undressed, and then having to wait all that time to really get the first game. Well, I'll tell you a story about Philly is that in Philly, because the teams are so close together, you don't need to wait. They just send you back down the street. (laughs) Yeah. My first time I ever got called up, um, it was, we played Friday at home. The, 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 it was, it was an incredible setup. Obviously both rinks were in the same park and what, like where the Wachovia center is today, the spectrum was there. Um, So we played at home at the spectrum. Friday night games over. I'm stretching in like our little like changing area. And Paul Holmgren was the assistant GM at the time. So Paul like walked into the training and looked at me and, and, or in the, in the stretching room and called me outside. And I'm thinking to myself, Oh no, like Paul Holmgren was like, you know, you, you ducked your head at the hallway when you walked by him. Cause you knew it was either like, you're either going up or you're going down. There was, it wasn't too many like in between conversations with, with, with Paul, but long and short, he called me out and said, Hey, you're uh we need you at the Covia Center tomorrow at 11 o'clock. we got a 1 o'clock game. We need you to take warm-ups. Uh, there's a player that might be injured, and we need you there. So clearly I didn't sleep the entire night. I get to Wachovia Center at 11. It got stretched out. Uh, like I said, Chris Terrian was the guy at the time that had a bad back, and he said, hey, be ready to go. Like, my back's, you know, messed up here. Hopefully I can I can, I can play, but I'm not sure. Be ready. So um, I took warm-ups um, flying around. You feel like you're, you're trying to get all revved up. You're nervous. You don't know what to do. The pucks are everyone's – Everyone's skating a million miles an hour. And um, sure enough, I walked down the runway, you know, after warmups and Paul's waiting for me. And he says, hey, pack your bag. Um, you got to hustle along to get back over to the practice facility. The, the, the Phantoms are heading to Hershey for a seven o'clock game tonight. Oh. So you went from thinking you're going to play an NHL game. And I, I'm like, I don't even have time for pregame meal and nothing. So I like stopped at Quiznos, grabbed a sub, got on the bus and, and went to Hershey Um for that night and, and somehow just luck be have it. But I ended up scoring a hat trick that night in Hershey wow, wow. Um, just from wow. you know, pure luck and how it worked out. And maybe the gods felt bad for me that I, you know, you thought you I'd still play. have a dart board with Chris Terriot's face on it. though. <laughs> 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 no, I, I laugh when I see Chris, cause I know he's doing a lot of media stuff in Philly and he's a good, he's a good guy. He's just, you know, it was just, he was just on, you know, he's on the back nine when I was there as, you know, from an age standpoint, but played a lot of games, put a lot of time in with Philly and uh, just part of it. It's just part of the game, you know, it's um, but anyways, it's it was good to kind of get over that hump and get an opportunity and and, and have an opportunity to, to play in the NHL. And then was there uh, you talked about, you know, that moment that, you know, I'm I'm close, I can play here. And then you're it seems like you're describing the roller coaster, the ups and downs of pro hockey being so close, getting a game here, going back. So how would you manage that roller coaster? And was there another moment in the NHL? You're like, not only can I play here, but I'm going to stay. Yeah, I don't know if I ever felt like I could stay. Um, You know, I, I think maybe that goes back to the and I'm a pretty optimistic guy, uh, but, I you know, I think you always. The NHL is like sacred ground, um, unless you're in my eyes, Ovechkin or Crosby or Patrick Kane or Jack Eichel, where those guys are obviously fixtures. You know, I think the 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 bright lights of of MSG uh, aren't always as bright for guys that are you know fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth defensemen or or you know whatever 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 forwards, right? Where you know, yeah, like you're here, but you don't know how long you're going to be here, um, and so. For me, it was, it's a good question. I, th- I think, you know, once I get called back up after, after my injury in training camp, uh, the 05, 06 year and, and really getting a fair opportunity, um, and playing and Chris Terrence, like I said, uh, sorry, uh, Eric Desjardins getting hurt and moving up a five, you felt like you had a little more like, like freedom. Um, you fit in well, you felt like you could play there at the time. It was, it was, it was Ken Hitchcock was a coach. You know, he was, he was in favor of, of what you're doing and how you're playing. Um, that year I ended up, I think having 20 something points, my best year I've had in the NHL for whatever reason. But, 
Um, a little bit of that was somehow I was um, I found myself running the the top of the power play with with Peter Forsberg on the half wall. Uh, same way, it was one of those moments like, <laughs> do they have the right guy? Am, am I supposed to be doing this right now? Um, but same way, I, I think a lot of it for for even for for those guys was I was I I just I was consistent. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I was very coachable. Um, it wasn't about me. It was about making the right play. And um, I thought it was easy. I'd get a puck. I, I'd take four or five strides in the middle and pass it back to Peter and then put my hands in the air. It was it was the best gig in the world. And, um, you know, I always – there was always a moment that – I remember one game that I, I, I didn't shoot the puck and I passed back to Peter and I got back to the bench and and Hitch was down at the other end of the end of the bench and he was yelling and screaming at me. And I, and I kind of looked at him like, I just passed to Peter Forsberg. What's the issue? <laughs> I, I don't get it. Did you want me yeah. to – the undersized defenseman shooting the puck from the point and I can pay, pass to Peter. Like it seemed like a no brainer for me, but um, no, I, and I, then I spent, you know, a few years in, 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 in Long Island and had, had a great run and, 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 and played, a, I would say played a lot and was playing good minutes. And um, you know, I think at that point you kind of feel like you, you, you made it and you, and you deserve to be there and, and you're, you're respected, I think, you know, from your teammates and from peers and, and guys around the league that you played hard and you played the right way. And, um, that you could play at that level. I think there's always anxiety for the bottom guys to think, you know, what's, what's next though. Don't, Freddie, short I have a, your, don't shortchange yourself. In that year in Philly, you had 27 points. So my, in my Plus world, in my line, world, that's oh. 30. Yeah. <laughs> that's like 60. I, when I tell yeah. kids, I'm like, yeah, I had like, I don't know, 52 points. I think one year in, Philly. <laughs> in 25 games. I don't know. I don't know what uh, happened. Uh, Fr Freddie, I have a question. Cause, um, we've had some other guests on and I think it's always interesting to hear the perspective of a player who was traded at the national hockey league level. Um, you know, it, and not only were you traded in 06, but you were traded for a very established thousand career NHL games, Alexi Zitnik. I think I'm, I remember correctly how to say his name, but um, you know, from, from experience of being traded, even at the junior level, I always had my best game, the next, my first game for that team. Cause it's almost like that team wanted me. They went out on a limb to, to move, to, to make a move to get me. And even with the, the Islanders trading Zitnik, obviously they saw something in you, you know, you know, was, was that a moment where you were like, wow, you know, I, I can, I, they, someone wants me, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to be a, a, a strong player for them. And, and the expectation now is, is, is that, you know, I'm a national hockey league player yeah. Um, another Paul Holmgren story for you. You're going to get sick of my Philly stories and kick no, me this never. So um, I was actually at that, at that time in Philly, the Flyers were struggling. Um, I, I tweaked my back a little bit. I think it was like in early December. Um, so I was actually, the team was on the road. The Flyers were on the road. I was at home training with the strength coaches at the practice facility, getting therapy and working out and getting, trying to get healthy. Um, towards the end of my workout, Paul Holmgren, same way, swung into the weight room and said, hey, Freddie, when you get a chance, swing down my office um, when you get done. So I said, all right, no problem, Paul. See you in a little bit. Um, so I went down to his office like a half an hour later. I walked in. He said, uh, he's like, I just want to let you know we made a trade today. I'm like, oh, who do we get? He's like, well, we traded you to Long Island for Zitnik. And I'm like, my jaw dropped. I'm like, what? Like, I, like, Philly had been great to me. Like, I spent my summers there. I, I just recently bought a house. And I was like, holy smokes. I'm like, what does this mean? And he's like, oh, somebody from Long Island will be calling you shortly. Good luck. Go get them. <laughs> and kind of like, like, you know, push you on your way almost. Um, and so I actually went to Long Island. Got, you know, like, so when I first got to Long Island, I was still out with an injury. So I didn't play right away. Uh, but usually you're right, right? You walk in, you feel like they wanted me. And I think um, that was the case in Long Island. Garth Snow was the GM there at the time. It was his first year. Um, I was, I was uh, I'll be in the record books, I think, as historically – his first, you know, his first move as a general manager, um, you know, maybe fa first failed move as, as a general manager, be, you know, but <laughs> either way I got there, I didn't play right away cause I was hurt. Once I got healthy, I got in the lineup um, and, and was playing, you know, a regular shift. And, and yeah, I think they saw, I think in their eyes, it was probably a swap on some money that they were trying to move maybe. And, and um, you know, like I said, the year before I had 26 or so points and, uh, you know, there's probably some projection there that I, it could continue. And, um, you know, I went there in 27, 27, 27, sorry, don't undersell. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that, that I could go there and, and, and help. And obviously it was, it was, you know, I ended up being there for, uh, on and off for three years, but it was, um, I, I agree with you though. Usually when a new guy comes in, like they, the, the trade happened for a reason on both ends of the spectrum. Real quick. And, uh, just to go on, uh, with the Islanders, 
you played with Andy Sutton, another friend of the program. So um, are you using Verbero gear yet? Uh, Andy and I were good. Are, are, we're in our good friends. So, yeah, Andy He's and I. He's a man. Uh, He's a man. You know, he, him and I were a guy. Uh, we're, we're, we were on the same same page a little bit when we were there in terms of, I'd say, healthy eating and trying to live healthy. And, um, you know, guys were guys were going out to dinner in, the, in New York to go to Capitol Grill and him and I were sneaking off to go to some like organic, uh, you know, vegetarian restaurant. Um, so him and I connected a lot. We played together a lot there. Um, it's always good to have some behemoth monster on your on your on your left side and and you can take liberties as much as you want. You got some protection out there if you need it. Uh, but he's a good man, and um, I'm happy for him that Rivero is is hopefully starting to pick up some speed. And uh, yeah, we're in the process of of uh, potentially opening a, a fit center here in the greater Boston area through Rivero, and awesome. uh, love to help him out. And and in same way, I think his heart's in the right spot, and um, and and he'll he'll do whatever he can to make that that successful. Yeah, that's episode, 100%. episode 31 with Andy Sutton. It's one of uh, yeah. our favorites. He really brought we're, it. We're honored to be part of the family yeah. as well. Yeah. We just got to get – We are. We just got to start. Yeah. yeah we're, Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, I mean, we're – they're going to be – we're going to be showing Verbero tons of love because we love what they're doing and yeah. I think the gear speech for itself. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But, Freddie, going back to, you know, your career um, – you ended up having a great NHL career over seven years, I think it was. And um, can you just take us through, I guess, the end and talk about, you know, how hard it was possibly to deal with head injuries and then your career ending? Yeah. Um, so my, my my last year in the NHL was uh, in Atlanta. Um, that year, in, I, I left Long Island. Um, I went to Atlanta and essentially um, – had to kind of make the team out of training camp. I was on a two-way contract at that point in Atlanta. So I went down there and, and had a same way. Once again, grind and battle for everything I, I, I could get. Uh, I ended up making the team out of training camp um, and was in Atlanta for the full year. Um, obviously, I, I didn't play a lot. I was, uh, once again, a seventh, sixth, seventh, eighth defenseman. I think, you know, I guess, I don't know, arrogantly, I felt like I could have played more. Uh, but same way, I understand the game and, and they had some younger guys that they wanted to play and, and push. And, um, you know, I was the guy that uh, showed up first every day. And and I and I and I, I hate to talk this way because it seems like it's so cliche, but like just showed up and, and did my thing and warmed up and trained and practiced hard as much as I as hard as I could um, and just try to and tried to be a real professional. Um, I always you know, when I used to sit guys out in the junior ranks of coaching, you know, I'd always tell the war story of, of, you know, I was a healthy scratch, literally took warmups, I think 22 games in a row in Atlanta um, and take warmups and then get out after warmups. And the assistant coach says, Hey, you're not going to go today, Freddie. And I'm like, ah, thanks. And then I sit down, you know, in the locker room and I, you know, I take my, my gear off and put my shorts on and, and have to walk out of the locker room and all the other guys are, you know, are, are focusing on going out to play the game in a few minutes. And, um, you know, it wasn't about me. It was, it was for me, it was, it was, I smiled, I, I revved him up. I probably did something stupid to get him fired up. And, and then I went across the street and, and worked out. And, um, you know, for me, it was all about being, trying to be professional. And, and I was, I was thankful that, um, the game has been so good to me. Um, and I think you got to make the most of those opportunities and be a professional and you can't, it's not about you. It's about the team. And, um, obviously I, you know, I, I started to play a little bit in Atlanta. I got, you know, I think the, they hit it on Luchik and then and then the soccer punch at the end. Um, you probably got the balls rolling a little bit upstairs in terms of the start of the concussions. And then um, you know, the other video that everybody always always zooms is like, I saw you die on the ice in Atlanta. Um, it's it's like the second one down behind the hit on Luchik. And um, you know, essentially in that game in Atlanta, I don't really have an answer. It's just I was I was I was playing a normal shift and uh, everything was good and I I, I was I was essentially standing at the offensive blue line, I think in the second period, it just felt like I was starting to um, starting to black out a little bit in a way for whatever reason. So I, I thought I had to try to get to the bench and uh, on my way to the bench, I collapsed at center ice and came to once the trainer came in, um, woke up, like knew the score, knew, checked all the concussion boxes, but um, for whatever reason had symptoms for the next four or five months and um, obviously didn't play there again in Atlanta and, and just took time to try to get healthy and I did. I trained hard all summer and um, felt great. And then went to Sweden and played one year in the Swedish Elite League for Moto. Um, back to my Peter Forsberg connection. He loved my 
sauce passes back down to the hash wall, uh, the half, <laughs> half wall. Uh, but no, but Peter helped facilitate me, uh, help facilitate for me to get over to Moto, and um, it was it was it was. I'm so happy I did. It was it was incredible um, being able to play in 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 Europe uh, at, at a high level, and the, the quality of life and, and everything was unbelievable. Um, felt great. Played like 30 something games, and just took a just a innocent hit in practice one day from a teammate, just doing a th- small area game, and um, the switch kind of got flipped back on with concussion wise. Um, I tried to, you know, I fought through it, did a bunch of treatments and, and acupuncture and a bunch of stuff in Sweden and just couldn't get, couldn't get clear. Um, couldn't get it, just couldn't get a clear head at that point. And um, obviously my wife and I, and, and I had young, you know, you have young kids at the time. Uh, I just decided there's, there's more to life than me trying to play a few more hockey games and decided to hang them up. And um, here we are, uh, you know, we've been living back in Boston, you know, since, since that year. Was there any time when it was coming to an end or once you decided to retire where you saw yourself doing something professionally outside of hockey? Um, I guess you never think it's going to end. And um, my wife always said, like, what are you going to do when this thing's over? What are you going to do when this thing's over? And, I'm, and like, as a player in the moment, like, I, I live very, I guess, very much in the moment. And I never, I never, like – want to think outside of that spot. And I think as a player, you, you, you're so locked in on what you're doing your next game or your next practice. So you, you, it's tough to think outside the, the, the scope. And I, I really had no idea. Um, so I, when I got done playing once again, I, I'm like, all right, I, I got, I got, I got my head's not doing well. Um, I went and took my real estate exam. I, I got my mass real estate license. I, I did that for a few weeks. I did a few other random job interviews um, that kind of just were localized uh, and once again, my wife was, you know, kind of, what are you going to do here? Like you've been in hockey your whole life. Um, it's what, you know, you're good at it. Why are you, why are we, you know, why are you going to go try to sell, you know, software for, for Oracle? Like, let's, you know, let's stay on task here almost. And, um, I reached into, um, a bunch of GMs and assistant GMs that I knew and, uh, same way I had no idea about the process really. And, um, you know, I'm very thankful that, um, Ron Hextall was the assistant GM in LA and, um, I re- e- emailed in, he called me almost instantly. And before I knew it, I was on a plane, um, you know, flying out to LA to meet with those guys. And um, they were potentially looking for an assistant coach in Manchester because Scott Pellerin was there, but decided to take a head coaching job. Um, so the timing just worked out and it was, it was Boston local so I could commute. Um, and it kind of got my foot into the, the coaching realm and, and kind of get it a feel on the back end of it. I was a player. You're always locked in on the player side of it, but it was fun um, getting a chance to be on quote unquote, the, the coaching slash management side of, of the game as well. I have a question on that. And I think it, this goes to everyone who has to figure out what they're going to do for the rest of their life professionally. And it's, um, I know I struggled with it, but especially for people who stay in hockey, I think it, there's always been the sense of, I have to put myself in a box where I either have to be a scout, a coach, a skills coach, and just like stay in that lane I think that kind of prohibits people from being opportunistic and, and doing a couple of different things. And so I know looking at what you've done um, in your post playing days, you've been able to, you know, um, do the skill stuff, coach at the pro level, coach at the prep level. Do you struggle with that at all? Like and think, okay, here's where I want to be or like, or are you okay kind of floating and, and building just a body of work in a bunch of different areas within the game? Um, to be honest with you, I love what I do. Um, I, I, I think, I don't think anybody should lock themselves into what they are or what they can be. Yeah. Um, you know, like I, for me, it's, it's, I, I, I guess I love, I love working with kids of all ages. Um, you know, is it, is it teaching a kid to take a wrist shot to lift the puck? Or is it, you know, maybe working with Connor Sherry in the summer on, on catching one-handed backhand slap shot passes uh, to get them ready for an NHL season? Like the, the, the scope is so different, but for me, it, it keeps the game so fresh. Um, yeah. I, I couldn't see myself, um, even, even to be honest with you, to take a step back, like I love the American League coaching. I love the development aspect of it. I love working with professionals. Um, I love, you know, seeing guys, you know, like we were, I was laughing the other day, Tyler Foley's in, 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 in Montreal now, and Tyler was in Manchester with us. And, you know, you, you've worked, I've worked with a lot of cool, cool play, you know, cool kids, I should call them that are now 
NHL studs. Um, and, and that was a great thing, but it also, um, I think what I do now, it keeps it very fresh. And if you get locked in, in my eyes as a scout, like all you're doing is watching games. Um, or if you're an American league coach, like you're kind of like doing the same things every day. Um, and for me where I'm at now and maybe it changes down the road is, is I love that. I, I, I don't say I do something every different every day, but I, you work with different populaces so much. You work with different kids, um, you know, through private lessons or, or small groups or coaching the prep team and, and dealing with high school age kids. And um, for me, I, I love the aspect of, of development and mentoring and, and helping kids of all ages. And um, you know, it's obviously, I always say it's like, you know, it's easy to work with pros, like come work with kids that can't skate or can't shoot. Yeah. Or, you know, might have some attention, you know, issues that it's tough for them to focus. And you need to find a way um, to maximize the time that you're on the ice with them. And, and for me, um, it kind of it, it, it puts me in a, in a spot that I can I know I say like put on my I put I, I wear like a red tracks dream big track suit. So I'm like, I, I got to put on my costume and, and go yeah. and go entertain. I, I feel like I'm uh, some days you're working at Faneuil Hall and you're tossing uh, chainsaws in the air and people are watching you and you got to put on a show, but I enjoy that. I enjoy that element of, of once again, I always think I'm, I'm teaching a game. I'm teaching, I'm teaching a sport. Like if I'm not smiling as the instructor, how are the kids going to, how are the kids going to smile and have fun with this? And I'm, I'm, you know, I try to keep it, um, just fun. Like I'll, I'll you know, if you get, tri- if you're at a skills program and you get tripped from behind, it's probably me skating by the line and just knocking your skates out. Like, because I want you to have fun and I want the kids to have fun. And I want them to know that they don't have to stand there like a soldier uh, that, that like, let's have fun out here. Let's get better. I need you to focus. I'm going to talk to you. We're going to educate you, uh, but enjoy the moment and, and, and let's maximize our time out here. And, and I think, uh, yeah, back to what the initial question was. I know I got sidetracked is I love what I do and to be able to help kids of all demographics and ages and skill sets, uh, is, is, is awesome. That's a great answer. And, and Freddie, I know one of my college roommates, actually, Brian Ward actually worked with you for a little bit. I don't know if it was at the time you were called big stars or dream big, um, hockey, but why don't you tell how that kind of came about the name when it was kind of born? And, you know, if we have any of our listeners, you know, that might be interested in working alongside you, you know, what age groups you work with and, and, and how they could potentially um, get with dream big. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I stole dream big from Simone Gagne um, to be honest with you. And Simone and I played together in Philly and he would sign hockey cards and he would write dream big and then he would sign his name. And I'm like, that is like the coolest thing in the world. And for me, that really always resonated that I'm like, this is like, this kind of like is who I am. And so from that moment, probably back in, I don't know, 05, I'm like, so now whenever I sign cards, I do this. I, I, I kind of carried on that like Simone Gagne tradition of like, you know, for little kids or whoever you're signing a card for um, to, to make it meaningful. And so when I got done playing and I was same way, kind of soul searching of what I wanted to do and, and uh, was kicking around tires of trying to start a business to, 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 teach some locals, kids, some skills and didn't really know where it was going to go. And I was thinking about names and, you know, most guys, obviously, you, you know, Joe Smo's uh, hockey camp, it's always a name base, uh, which is probably good for like marketing and, and brand recognition. Uh, but the dream big thing always kind of, always kind of hit me that like, this is powerful. Um, I love it. I want to make it, I, you know, I, I want kids to inspire the same way to dream big, you know, you want to make your, your peewee two team, like whatever it may be, it's, that's the goal. But go for it and put time in and chase it. Um, and who knows what will happen. So that's kind of how it, how it grew. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, um, has kind of taken off and, and, you know, it's, it's been, it's been really good, really good to, I guess, I guess me and to, to us as a family in terms of the business. And, um, but once again, I think, um, kids enjoy it. Kids want to come skate because they're going to have fun. Um, the message is, yeah, we're going to work on skills. We're going to develop, but you're going to have fun when you're doing this. Um, and so for me, that's, that's really powerful. And um, you know, I like what, I guess back to your question, if there's people listening that are coaches that are looking to uh, either, yeah, you got kids that want to come train. Great. Uh, Dream big hockey stars is the website. Uh, if you're, a, if you're a, 
if you're a college hockey player that's recently graduated from college and you don't know what your next step your, your next step is, get on the contact form on the website and and, and hit me up and um, all conversations with anybody and help you out here and get you started. And um, if you got passion and you can skate, let's go. Um, you know that's 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 the powerful thing for me. And um, you know I think that the guys and, and the and the people that I have working uh, for us now, uh, Courtney Sherry's and Jason Lawrence's and Maggie Deverners and um, the one thing they bring is passion and obviously they all played division one hockey, if not higher, but, um, they also, they, they show up every day cause they love the game and, and they, they, they want to give back and teach kids. And, and once again, like, uh, you know, I hope, I hope, you know, if, the, if you were to talk to them, they would say, you know, the, the passion is there and that's, what's, that's, what's exciting about showing up to go to work every day. Yeah. This has been uh, great so far and a couple more segments here, Freddie, and we're going to, uh, before we end with favorite memory, guys, I think we're going to go to the fan questions here. And it goes back to, you know, talking about having fun in practice. And this is from my co-coach, uh, Chris Gragnano. And he asks, how often do you take practice reps from your players? Dot, dot, dot. Asking for a friend. That's me. <laughs> how many times do I take practice reps? From your players. How often do you get involved in the drills? Because I, I have a little bit of an issue with it. Um, i jumping in. I, I love... I love when we only have five D and we need a six D or we have only seven D and we need an eighth D. And then I jump in and, and I'm probably out of shape compared to where I should be. And, but I could still skate and I can still defend and I'm, I still have a pretty good head on my, on my shoulders. So I'm, I'm smarter than uh, most 16 year old, you know, high school hockey players. Um, the guys love it. I think I, I, I love it. It, it uh, you know, you know, I, I love sometimes jumping in on, on penalty kill scenarios where, you kind of give them over overextended looks and reads and makes it makes their life a lot harder. They get frustrated by it, but I also think it makes them see the game um, in a deeper sense. Um, and where, where especially if there's maybe a, a, a moments where you can jump in to either demo the drill uh, or run it or show a kid an example, or on the flip side, just to jump in to get reps. And um, you know, I, I love it. I love it. I love. Uh, I love being on it and. Uh, if I score on the goalie, there's going to be for sure an excel uh, uh, celebration and probably some smack talking along the way. But once again, it's all about it's all about bringing a smile to kids' faces and and, and enjoying the moment. And um, you know, in the same way, if you don't if I don't score, you can you can laugh at me too and tell me I shoot like a wimp or whatever it may be. So, and but George, you got to check out Freddie's on ice coaching style because you can't wear notion pads, but you also can't wear like your regular shin pads that you used to wear. But Freddie, I remember seeing you have these perfect like, Those coaching are the, the shin pads. pads. They, if, oh, if, are they? If anyone is coaching and you don't wear shin pads, you're out of your mind. I agree with you. <laughs> Once you start wearing knee pads, referee knee pads, little thin CCM ones, yep. they are they are a game changer. I uh, So that that's um that's actually let's let's make sure everyone hears that because yeah. I was like, where did he get these special shin pads that just look <laughs> and, so and good for a coach? For me, they see them and they're like now that they just you, you yeah. if I get on the ice without my shin pads, I'm like a skeleton of what I, yeah. I usually am. Um, I feel like shin pads gives me like full body protection to mm -hmm. skate as fast as I can. And and I had a moment uh, a couple weeks ago in, in my older son's 2007 practice where we were doing three on two entries, and once again there was a forward missing, so I saw a green light that I could jump in, and um, we we're essentially doing a three on two attack over the blue line. I got the puck. I was driving kind of the driving to this, the near side post. And there was a, the third guy was driving the backside post. And I, I laid it across and turned to get out of the way at the goal line. And I don't know what I caught or lost an edge. And, and luckily I had my CCM shin pads on because they took the blunt of the, the Zamboni door that I crashed into. And I thought the kids were going to cry that I was going to die on the ice. But luckily <laughs> um, a, a little bit of a sore hip and a, and, a, and, a, and a left shoulder. But besides that, the shin pads saved my Save my leg. No, no free ads to CCM. It's only for Barrel. Uh, yeah. well, well, uh, I'll have to get Andy uh, maybe a custom, yeah. custom yeah. coaches shin pads. Meyer, yep. Meyer line, dream big line. Yep. I think we got one more uh, fan question here. There's actually a couple we can pick from, but I'm going to pick first. Uh, what was it like playing in the old barn as an Islander? I'm assuming that's the the Coliseum. Do you have any memories from there? Standing, isn't it? Um, the, the the Coliseum is. It's an old barn. Um, you know, I think they've put some Band-Aids on it in the meantime. It's exciting, uh, I'm sure, for the organization to be getting a new rink here soon. Um, you know, it's just, unfortunately, it's it's has a ton of history. They, they've won a whole lot of hockey games there over the, over the time, but um, there's nothing there's nothing 
nothing like a new rink with, with fresh stalls and, and fresh amenities. Um, but I think there's a lot of history there as well, and I'm sure they're excited for the new arena coming soon. All right, last one, actually. I'm going rapid fire now. Who would you want on your, si- on your side in a bar fight? Steve Webb, Eric Goddard, uh, or Eric Carnes? Is that, how, is that how you say it? Carnes? Steve Islanders, huh? Yeah, some big Islanders fans. Well, we actually have we actually get fan questions. Yeah, we're throwing Love it. Love it. <laughs> Love it. This is good. Um, good <laughs> question. There's a couple of big guys there. I would say Steve Webb. He's probably undersized compared to those other guys, but he's got a you know big heart. Remember, he's got huge hands too. He was around Philly, uh, Long Island when I was there. Um, yeah, and he's a good guy. So I'd say S- Steve Webb would be. Uh, yeah, or Andy's and he's and he can probably run in case we got to run out of there too. If we <laughs> yeah. in trouble. Yeah. And then you talked about uh, Holmgren a bit. So what was uh, what was Millberry like in uh, on the island? Mike was not there when I was there. Oh, he wasn't. Well, well he was. Uh, I'm not sure what his last year was there. Um, the first block that, out. Block, <laughs> block yeah. that fan. Block that fan. Yeah. <laughs> hey, see if right, my- I, got, I got to do my homework there. That's on me. That might be a brain question. Maybe they're trying to trick me to see if I had him. Depending on what things are doing. Oh my goodness! All right, last one. Favorite memory of the game? Does anything come to mind? Um, favorite memory, I would just say first NHL game. Um, we were in Washington. It was literally, it's a blur, so it's not even a memory. Um, but just the moment of being able to get on the ice and drops and you're playing in your first NHL game. And, uh, once again, you know, undersized, you know, defenseman from the middle of New Hampshire that, uh, never really felt like he probably should have made it, uh, made it. And, um, yeah, I always reflect back on that that moment in time um, back in uh, 03, 04. I can't stop thinking about Forsberg on the half ball now. Unbelievable. Did you pass it? Man, like you, it, it's what I always love is people, former players who own their story and then can kind of carry that. And that's, that's what dream big is. And um, I think it's perfect. So, yeah, no, I appreciate it. It's been, um, I've had a great, you know, great, I guess for me, it's, it's, I know that, you know, the next, the next shift is, is the message here. And I think for me, it's, it's the message I would say that I, if I haven't conveyed it is find something that you're passionate in and chase it. And I think it, no matter what it is, if it's selling software or it's, 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 if it's, if maybe it is scouting or maybe it's, it's running a business or, or helping kids or, or coaching or teaching, whatever it may be is, you know, it's cliche, but you know, you, you, you know, there's never, there's never a bad day that you have to go to the rink to teach. And, and I've loved, I've loved every minute of it. And I always thank my wife for pushing me in this direction. So I'm not sitting at a desk chair, uh, selling software. It's, I kind of found my, my, my sweet spot and, um, but I love it. I got passion for it and, um, chase, chase your dreams, chase your dreams and, and, uh, go take it from there. It's awesome. Freddie, this was awesome. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say, please give, um, one of the former, former guests on the show and one of my dearest good friends, Bruce Cassidy. Hello from, from all of us. Cause, uh, okay. he was, he was a great guest and he was a, very, very good to us. Yeah, uh, we, he lives. Uh, I don't see him a ton in season, but obviously out of season, his kids have skated a little bit with us as well. Uh, he lives. We live locally here, uh, Greater right. Boston. So it's um, yeah. And uh, we got Jay Pandolfo too. So we got the whole staff. Oh, wow. it's lo- local. It. So um, it's all it's all good. But good, good, good people, good hockey people. And I think that's what's special about uh, this game is that most most people that have ever put the skates on, um, it does something to center you center your inner inner good guy and and uh it's a great game and and it's a small community so um you know you always respect those guys along the way definitely well definitely we just, well thank we just yeah i think here. might have lost sean but freddie we'll, we'll we'll let you run now but we really appreciate your time and if there's anything we can do to help and um like you said it's it's dreambighockey.com dreambighockeystars.com dreambighockeystars.com for all of our listeners who uh have interest in skating with Freddie and, um, you know, getting their, getting their skills, you know, sharpened. And obviously if those players that are listening, that might need some, some guidance or want to help Freddie out, they can, they can go there as well. So thanks so much, Freddie. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.